Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath, though it's not Sabbath here for another two and a half hours. Um, but I welcome everybody to the Friday night study. Uh, to our, we're calling it the Vespers now. It's Friday night Vespers. Uh, before we begin this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, that we can open your word together, that we can look at our history, a much more recent history than often is examined. We look at the history of Millerite history and early Adventist history, but this history has been hidden and forgotten, and so we need your Holy Spirit to clearly bring these things to our understanding and that we can apply the things we learn into our personal study and into our lives. I pray for each person that you can watch over them. And I thank you, Lord, that I'm again back here on Friday evening for these studies. We pray uh, uh, for Felix and his wife and, and it's Sabbath for them now, Sabbath morning. And we ask that you can continue to bless them in the work there. And um, we are thankful, Lord, for each of the people that has been following uh, these studies on righteousness by, by faith. We just ask that um, you can continue to lead us in these studies and that we can um, that we can be able to understand this information to communicate it to others and that others will be drawn uh, to Christ through the work that we do in ministering to them. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening again, and uh, I'm Kelly. So we've been looking at uh, the letters to the churches. We started looking at it a couple weeks ago. And um, M.L. Andreessen was an Adventist uh, minister. He had spent some time with Ellen White a few months back in the early uh, 1900s, uh, the early 20th century, uh, when Ellen White was fairly old, and he was a young minister, and uh, that really helped his faith in the spirit of prophecy. He is labeled presently by many within the church as uh, believing in a, a dangerous heresy called LGT. Last Generation Theology. As, as many people know, M.L. Andreas was an Adventist minister who the church presently labels as teaching Last Generation Theology, which is the idea that before Christ returns, we have to represent his character. His character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people before he can come to claim them as his own. And that is considered heresy within Adventism, my personal Adventist ministers, friends of mine, personal friends of mine who are Adventist it's ministers, believe that this last generation theology is a danger, even though you, they used to believe in it at one time. So what we have here is there's these conferences that were done, and we're going to read about them, um, that were done in the 1950s and so that, that we sometimes call them the evangelical conferences and um, so we're just going to start reading through this and discussing it now when we when we approach a study like this we're, we're reading something that somebody has written this is ml andreason and and it is going to be a bible study that is he's going to present some scriptures uh, but we always need to remember that we need the Holy Spirit uh, to give us an understanding of this history, because these are our people. You know, this, we're not reading the Bible here at this point, though he's going to present some scriptures. And we've gone through righteousness by faith. We've gone through uh, a lot of this history already as far as the doctrine of it. Uh, but it's really important to know this attack that happened within the church, these seeds that were planted of which we are now reaping the baleful fruit. And the book Questions on Doctrine was published in 1957, wasn't really understood at the time by most Adventists as a dangerous book. 
That is, there was some seeds planted there. And so that's what ML Andreessen is going to address. But first, he's going to look at the conferences, what was done at the conferences. For a report of this, we are confined almost entirely to the published account in eternity. So what he's saying is that to know what actually happened at the evangelical conferences, our ministers aren't telling us about what happened at these secret conferences. So we have to find this out from the evangelicals who were at the conferences because they're going to tell us what happened. Uh, the subject that took up much of the time at the conferences was that of the sanctuary. Dr. Barnhouse was frank in his estimate of this doctrine. In particular, did he object to our teaching on the investigative judgment, which he characterized as the most colossal psychological face-saving phenomenon in religious history. Later, he called it the unimportant and almost naive doctrine of the investigative judgment and said that any effort to establish it is stale, flat, and unprofitable. Now, I remember reading uh, the book Kingdom of the Cults just shortly after I was baptized, maybe a month or two after I was baptized in 1982. So this would have been, I think it was in February that I got a hold of the book. And I was told about the book because I went to a retreat on New Year's. So I got baptized Christmas, 1982. 1983, New Year's Day, I was at uh, that Sabbath. I was at a, a Christian retreat, teen time, and they did a study on cults. And so this pastor, Pastor Paul, told me about this book, Kingdom of the Cult. So I, I'm not sure exactly when I, I might've got it like even in January, but I know by February I had read the book. So I read the whole book. It's a big thick book dealing with cults. So I didn't just read the appendix called The Puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism. I actually read the whole book. I wanted to understand cults and what was behind them. Now in this book, he says, well, Adventists are no longer a cult they, they call them, uh, what was their name, uh, a heredox, uh, I think is the word they used, so that we're, 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 not, we're not a cult, but we have some strange teachings. But we, you know, had changed our doctrines so that we could be uh, accepted by the evangelical community. And that's what I got from that book. So I knew the Adventist church had changed their doctrines to be accepted by the evangelicals. That was really clear. And uh, but this statement here, the most colossal psychological face saving phenomenon, I think in the book it said a face saving device. Now, can we think of other events in biblical history that are often characterized as a face saving device? What would uh, people who are opposed to Christianity uh, usually characterize as a face-saving device of Christianity. Face-saving device. Face-saving device. So there's an event in Christian history that non-Christians, Christian critics, criti critics of Christianity, label as a face-saving device. What, what about the resurrection? What about the message? face road? Right. So the idea is that, you know, Christians had this, you know, this guy, Jesus, and then, you know, he died, and so they made up this idea that he was uh, resurrected, right? And so you can see that there's a definite parallel to the criticism that critics of Christianity have in regarding to Christ's first coming and those events connected with the spring types, the Passover, right, and the wave offering, Right. Christ is going to be resurrected on the day of the wave offering. So he's going to be the wave offering. Um, and so you can see that there is definitely uh, a parallel. Well, the Damascus Road as a face saving device. I don't know if that's a face saving device. The, the thing is, for Christianity, its foundation is the cross. Right. And, and for Adventism, what is the foundation of Adventism and central pillar? The Bible. Well, Ellen White says the foundation and central pillar of Adventism is? Sabbath. 
She says the 300 days in connection with the sanctuary. Or sanctuary. The sanctuary in connection with the 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Felix put there the Bible. Well, yeah, the Bible is obviously the foundation of, of all truth. But as far as Adventism itself, the particular teaching that characterizes and distinguishes Adventism is There's the message one, of the sanctuary. Yeah. The Sabbath There's and all only, these things come out of it, right? So if you think only, about, like, what's that, Kelly? Only one doctrine that we hold that no other church in the world holds, the sanctuary doctrine. Right, yes. Yeah, so it's it's something that's unique to Adventists. Now, and, and it's kind of interesting because when I became an Adventist, uh, you know, I, I got the book Kingdom of the Cults, but I also went to, uh, you know, I bought it at a Christian bookstore. It used to be uh, the Canadian Bible Society used to have a really nice bookstore in Edmonton. And uh, but I, I I tried to find a commentary on the book of Hebrews once I got interested more in the sanctuary. And um, I would look through all these different commentaries and you would read these scriptures talking about Christ being our high priest and the commentaries would not comment on Christ as our high priest at all. It's almost as if they didn't actually see what was being said in the scriptures. So they would they would get some kind of devotional teaching out of what what the scriptures were saying. But it was almost as if they were completely blind to the idea that Christ was our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, even though the Bible plainly stated that he was. Right. It's like they just couldn't see it. It was like it just had never crossed their mind. And so even though they read it, uh, they couldn't see it. So I remember the first sermon I ever did regarding this message uh, when I started studying this message in um, 2010. It was, uh, it was it was in December. I'm trying to think what the date was. I could probably find it out. So after I had accepted, because I was in uh, November 7th, uh, 2010, that I met Jeff Pippinger in Oklahoma, and then and then it was yeah it was Christmas Day, uh, 2010 that I did a sermon dealing with the parallel between the disciples' disappointment. And the Millerite disappointment, right? So we can see that the disciples' disappointment parallels the dis- disappointment of the Millerites, right? Ellen White says it does, but, but it, it, even if she didn't say it, it, it paralleled, we can see quite plainly it does. And we can see the criticism that the resurrection is a face-saving device it's just something because of their disappointment, they made up the resurrection. Uh, we can see the parallel to our disappointment in the criticism that's being brought against it. So if um, Donald Barnhouse had really thought about it, the criticism that he was giving against Adventism, he would have to recognize that if that is valid, then the, the criticism against Christ beginning his work in the heavenly sanctuary is is would be just on the same basis right so you can see that he's he's shooting himself in the foot without realizing does that make sense to people yes yeah oh yeah so so it's something i saw really early on because i remember reading that statement and i was thinking wow that that's really really interesting because he's not seeing that his criticism of Adventism is a criticism of Christianity. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to emphasize that point because to me this was something that was a revelation to me. It was really something that helped me after I became an Adventist to recognize the type of attacks. So mostly I was really interested in anti-Adventist literature when I first became an Adventist. So we didn't have the internet back then. So I just found went to the library, found every book I could read against Adventism. And and that's how I learned to actually understand Adventism was by reading and the stuff against Adventism and studying it on my own. 
Okay, it goes on, Dr. Barnhouse, in discussing Hiram Edson's explanation of the disappointment in 1844, says that the assumption that Christ had a work to perform in the most holy before coming to this earth is a human face saving idea, which some uninformed Adventists carried to fantastic literalistic extremes. Mr. Martin and I heard Adventist leaders say flatly that they had repudiated all such extremes. They said uh, in no uncertain terms, this they said in no un uncertain terms. Further, they do not believe as some of their earlier teachers taught that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on a second ministerial work since 1844. This idea is also totally repudiated. So this is what the evangelicals are saying in the, in the 1950s regarding what our ministers said to them at the evangelical conferences, that they reputed the idea that Christ is doing a, an intoning work since the cross, that he's still carrying on a second ministerial work since 1844. So they say this idea was totally repudiated. Now, wasn't that one of the issues right. in the 1919 Bible Conference? No. The one of the issues, uh, the, the uh, Christ as priest? No, no, they didn't. They didn't have that issue then, though they were planting seeds for it. So the the first <clears throat> thing that they're really going to start to do is um, undermine the necessity of understanding the prophetic periods. So people like W.W. Prescott, um, he's not interested in the 2300 days anymore, right? Because these aren't things that we really can prove. So, so first they're going to take away the prophetic foundation for the 2300 days. And then they can finally get rid of the investigative judgment altogether. Now, remember when we were looking at Wagner's uh, confession of faith, the last thing that he wrote before he died, uh, that that confession of faith, he had repudiated the sanctuary doctrine, right? And he said he had done this quite early on, though I think he's actually being a bit dishonest, right? So, because um, people do that, they sort of rewrite their history, their memory changes as they... Uh, change their beliefs so he says he never really believed in it you know once he was converted though he continued to teach it <laughs> so um but you know i i think he's probably corrected that that a seed had been planted in, in his thinking um that sort of led to him eventually uh, um rejecting the sanctuary message but but we can see that's the evangelicals say this is what they understood from the conference. Our church doesn't give us what happened at the conference, right? They're just going to give the book Seventh-day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine, right? The, the answers that they gave to the evangelicals. But they're written in a way that's not, uh, it's not clear, right? And, and we'll see that as we go through this. Okay, so... Um, he says, Andreessen says, note these statements. The idea that Christ had a work to perform in the most holy place before coming to this earth is a human face saving idea. And Mr. Martin and I heard the Adventist leaders say flatly that they repudiated such extremes. This they said in no uncertain terms. Okay. I think it is due the denomination to have a clear cut statement from our leaders if Dr. Barnhouse and Mr. Martin told the truth when they heard our leaders say that they repudiated the idea that Christ had a work to do in the second apartment before coming to this earth, uh, this question demands a clear-cut clear answer. And I don't think it has ever been answered, as far as I know, by the church. So the church has never, uh, that is, the church has never accused Barnhouse and Martin of lying, Okay but they have never confirmed that that what they say in that book is the truth, right? So they basically have not given an answer. Their answer is supposed to be, uh, well, you just read the book Questions on Doctrine and, and it's supposed to answer it. 
Okay, before reporting further what was done at the conferences, let us come back to the two men who on that first day of May 1957 met with the White Board of Trustees to seek their counsel and also to make a suggestion. The men were well acquainted with the statements made by Dr. Barnhouse and Mr. Martin that the idea of Christ's ministry in the second compartment in the heavenly sanctuary had been totally repudiated. This had been in print for several months at that time and had not been protested. The men, however, did not need the printed statement for both of them had had a part in the discussions with the evangelicals. One of them in particular had taken a prominent part in the conferences, had visited Dr. Barnhouse in his home, had spoken to Doc in Dr. Barnhouse's churches at his invitation. He was one of the four men who really carried the load and the one chosen to accompany Mr. Martin in his tour of the West Coast to speak in our churches. He was held in high esteem by Dr. Barnhouse. This feeling was mutual. About the time when the two men first visited the vault, a series of articles appeared in the ministry, that's the ministry magazine, which claimed to be the Adventist understanding of the atonement confirmed and illuminated and clarified by the spirit of prophecy. In the February issue, 1957, the statement occurs that the sacrificial act on the cross is a complete, perfect, and final atonement for man's sin. This pronouncement is in harmony with the belief of our leaders, as Dr. Barnhouse quoted them. It is also in harmony with the statement signed by a chief officer in a personal letter. You cannot, Brother Andreasen, so this is in quotation marks, you cannot, Brother Andreasen, take away from us this precious teaching that Jesus made a complete and all-sufficient atoning sacrifice on the cross. This we shall ever hold fast and continue to proclaim it, even as our dear venerated forefathers in the faith. So Andreasen goes on, he says, it would be interesting. Just, just a thought, yeah, if I okay. may interrupt you. <clears throat> uh, so, in one sense, is that true? Like, it was complete. Well, not complete in the sense he means, I guess. But, I mean, Jesus gave all that he had and could. It's the so he, part he of made, he made applying a complete, it. Yeah, so he made a complete sacrifice. But the atonement wasn't complete. The sacrifice... For the atonement was complete, right? But you can't say the atonement right. was complete. The sacrifice was complete. Breaking down the word finished. atonement. And he says it, it is finished, right? So Yeah, breaking down the atonement to help understand it would be at one moment. So God well, has it. I don't become, like that. Okay, okay. Right. But the idea is is that we're we haven't been fully reconciled or I'm not sure. You know where I'm going, though. Yeah, well, atonement for sin. So that's a reconciliation for sin. The sacrifice for sin. Sin needs to be atoned for. Right? So, um, and and Christ did that sacrifice. He died once for all. Right? He's not going to be dying again and again. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so that he dies once for all at the end of the world. So that sacrifice for the atonement is complete. But you can't say the atonement is complete because there still is a work of atonement to do. Once the sacrifice is offered, the priest has to take that sacrifice and the blood of that sacrifice and minister it right in the sanctuary. Now, that's typical of the work that he mm. does in our lives. Right. Also, the flip side of the coin of what the counterfeit is in the papacy in the mass. Well, yeah, well, the papacy counterfeits, but let's let's not worry about the papacy here. Okay. The papacy here at this Very point, nice. it's just that we know that Christ, he died. He doesn't have to keep dying, right? So in that sense, the atoning sacrifice is complete. So so what they're doing is they're playing with language, right? They're giving things double meaning. So they want to say it in a way that. You and I as Seventh-day Adventists can say, well, yeah, Christ did a complete atoning sacrifice, right? That makes sense. You know, it's complete. It's all sufficient sacrifice and it's atoning sacrifice. 
but mm -hmm. but they they do this double meaning so that the even they write it in a way that the evangelicals can say oh see they're teaching that the atonement was completed at the cross right and so you can say it that yeah. way to them yeah we believe of course we believe the atonement is completed you know at the cross a dishonest sleight of hand sort of thing. ah yes right and i brought this up before where that, that's one of the problems with writing out a statement of beliefs like a creed because you can write it in such a way that people who actually think differently can agree with it right that's generally what, what you do you write it by committee <laughs> so let's put it into words that everybody, even though we think differently on this point, can all agree with the words. But we agree with the words, but we give them different meaning. So, for instance, my dad, you know, with his uh, the United Church of Canada saying that the Bible is the word of God. Right. So they can say, well, you know, we put the Bible as the word of God that made happy the the people who believe the Bible to be the word of God. But they can mean something different by it. You know, the Bible's the word of God, so is the Reader's Digest, right? <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah right? So, yeah. so you can see that that sort of unclear language written in a way that it's, it's uh, I'll use the word bifurcated, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's a, a double, a split tongue, right? Like Satan, like a snake, you know, it, it, and, and that's that's the problem is that language is meant to convey ideas clearly. So when we have language obfuscate, cloud things up, make them unclear, then we are on dangerous ground. That That's really politics. Right? So instead of just stating to the evangelicals what we believe, we wanted to write it in a way that they could accept us as no longer being a cult. Well, many Adventists would still hold to these doctrines, right? And eventually over time is that, you know, we can get all of those, you know, legalists, this, the people who are, you know, extreme or whatever, we can we can weed them out through, through attrition by death. You know, they'll eventually die and their children will end up believing these new doctrines. And that's actually what happened, is that the Adventists who still believe the truth you know, they weren't fooled by this, but they eventually die and their children, you know, are brought up with this watered down language. So um, he goes on here, Andreas, it would be interesting if the writer could produce proof of his assertion. The truth is our forefathers believed and proclaimed no such thing. They did not believe that the work on the cross was complete and all sufficient. They did believe that a ransom was there paid, and that was all sufficient. But the final atonement awaited Christ's entrance into the Most Holy in 1844. This the Adventists have always taught and believed. This is the old and established doctrine which our venerated forefathers believed and proclaimed. They could not teach that the atonement on the cross was final, complete, and all sufficient and yet believe that another atonement, also final, occurred in 1844. Such would be an absurd and meaningless. Paying the penalty for our sin was, indeed, a vital and necessary part of God's plan for our salvation, but it was by no means all. It was, as it were, placing in the bank of heaven a sum sufficient and in every way adequate for any contingency and which could be drawn on by and four, each individual is needed. This payment was the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1, 19. In his death on the cross, Jesus paid it all. But the precious treasure becomes efficacious for us only as Christ draws upon it for us. And this must await the coming of the world, of, into the world of each individual. Hence, the atonement must continue as long as people are born. Hear this. Uh, there is an inexhaustible fund of perfect obedience occurring from his obedience. How is it that such an infant, if infinite treasure is not appropriate? In heaven, the merits of Christ, his self-denial, 
and self-sacrifice are treasured up as incense to be offered up with the prayers of his people. And that's from General Conference Bulletin, Volume 3, page 101, 102, fourth quarter, 1899. Note the phrases, inexhaustible fund, infinite treasure, merits of Christ. This fund was deposited at the cross, but not used up there. It is treasured up and offered up with the prayers of God's people. And especially since 1844 is this fund drawn on heavily, heavily as God's people advance to holiness. But it is not exhausted. There is sufficient and to spare. Here again, he who through his own atonement provided for them an infinite as infinite fund of moral power will not fail to employ this power in their behalf. He will impute to them his own righteousness. There is an inexhaustible fund of perfect obedience accruing from his obedience. As sincere, humble prayers ascend to the throne of God, Christ mingles with them the merits of his own life of perfect obedience. Our prayers are made fragrant by this incense. Christ has pledged, pledged himself to intercede in our behalf, and the Father hears his Son. When we pray in this very year, 1959, Christ intercedes for us and mingles with our prayers, the merits of his own life of perfect obedience. Our prayers are made fragrant by this incense, and the Father always hears his Son. Contrast this with the statement in Questions on Doctrines, page Questions on Doctrine, page 381. Jesus appeared in the presence of God for us, but it was not with the hope of attaining something for us at that time or at some future time. No, he had already obtained it for us on the cross. Note the picture. So we obviously don't. Uh, okay. Christ appears in the presence of God for us. He pleads, but he gets nothing. For 800 years, he pleads and gets nothing. Does he not know that he already has it? Will no one inform him that it is useless to plead? He himself has no hope of getting anything now or at any future time. And yet he pleads and keeps on pleading. What a sight for the angels. And this is represented to be Adventist teaching. This is the book that has the approval of Adventist leaders and is sent out to the world to show what we believe. May God forgive us. How can we stand before the world and convince anyone that we believe in a savior who is mighty to save when we present him as pleading in vain before the father? So, so, I mean, just follow this. So again, it, they say in that book, Jesus appeared in the presence of God for us, but it was not with the hope of attaining something for us at that time or at some future time. No, he had already obtained it for us on the cross. So you can see this, this emphasis, this change. We'll call it an emphasis, but it's actually a change of doctrine that occurred with the book Questions on Doctrine. It, it is a type of sleight of hand because it, it sounds good if you're not really thinking about it, right? So we're, we're going to say everything happened at the cross. Right. And this this is going to be the argument E.J. Wagner has in his in his confession of faith. Right. Everything's about the cross um, and that the cross actually happened like in in the years of eternity. And yet, you know, in the past, like in, before the foundation of the world. And then he's going to say, but, but Christ came and died for us. But that that was all available. And so when we went through Wagner's argument, it was it was a contradiction. Because we know that just as the cross, Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, it doesn't mean that the cross itself doesn't occur in history, right? It's not like people before the cross were saved in some other way. They were all saved by faith in Christ. Nobody is saved by works. Everybody's saved by grace through faith, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So um, the fact that that things have to occur in history has nothing to do with the fact that 
that those things aren't available until that time. That is, we can experience, even though the atonement is not complete in a historical sense, right? Because if it was complete, all history would have ended, right? There's a work that has to be done. That is, Christ is ministering the benefits of what he accomplished in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. He's completing that in us. And when that work is complete on in the sort of arbitrary number of people that God has set up, 144,000, right? When Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in that number of people, then Christ can return. Right? Sorry, my mind was wandering. Say that again. So, Christ has set up an arbitrary number of people to demonstrate what he accomplished at the cross is real. 144,000 living saints will have to go through the experience that Christ went through on the cross. Right? It is, they're going to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That sounds great. The way I understand it, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what the church calls last generation theology. And um, LGBT. They say, that that's, they say that that's arbitrary? The they say it's an arbitrary number. God could have chosen any number, right? He chose 144,000 as the number, right? Because it's, it fits symbolically yeah. on the line as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so God has chosen this number of people. If he had, you know, 143,999, that number would not be made up. So, so God has, has set a standard of, of what he, he is going to accomplish. 144,000 living saints will go through the time of Jacob's trouble, will continue to be righteous because God has declared them righteous because they are righteous. He doesn't make them righteous when he closes their probation and declares them righteous. They are righteous, right? They have the righteousness of Christ. And they will continue to display the righteousness of Christ, even in the most trying circumstances. And because of that, then the history of this world can be closed up. Then Christ can return. Because if this did not happen, Christ can't return. Mm -hmm. Reason right, because, being, it proves God is saying what's true. Yeah. Uh, and also requirement to demonstrate before the universe mm -hmm. that God can make a people like that. Yeah, this and is the, the whole. Others will be safe. To yeah, this is the this is the whole issue of the great controversy, right? This is the great controversy thing. This is the thing. That, that God showed Ellen White that answers all of these objections that people bring against Christianity. It is such a complete picture and understanding of truth of what God wants to accomplish in humanity. It addresses the whole issue of sin from the beginning, the mystery of iniquity, and the mystery of righteousness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right? It explains why Christ has to come a second time, why he couldn't just have wrapped everything up the first coming. His whole work of the whole symbolism of the sanctuary ministry. And then, of course, the book of Revelation, which lays out all of the different articles of furniture in a prophetic line, right? The candlesticks, the table of showbread, the laver, right, which is the sea of glass, um, uh, the altar of burnt offering. The altar of incense, right? The ark. All of these are described in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Illustrating Christ's work throughout history as a progression of the sanctuary message. It's something that's unique to Adventism. And, and our church has really downplayed this. Right? They've, they've repackaged it in something that is divorced from the idea of the great controversy. And, and we see this watered down sort of 
um, teaching within Adventist books, within the Sabbath school quarterly. Uh, the church is not going to teach that there's going to be 144,000 living saints that are going to reflect Christ's character perfectly. They don't teach that anymore. And yet that is Adventism. To me, that's that's what Adventism is. That's yeah. why I'm an Adventist. Jeff, you had a comment? Just your... No, like, no, no. Just think out loud. Okay. Okay. Okay, so so we can see that that there is to understand this progressive work that Christ is doing for us now. You can see why if we believe that atonement was completed at the cross, you're going to have a completely different idea of salvation. Right? Yes, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. Definitely does. <clears throat> So Andreasen goes on, he says, but thank God this is not Adventist doctrine. Hear this from Sister White is quoted above. Christ has pledged himself to intercede in our behalf, and the Father always hears his son. This is Christianity, and the other is not. Shall we remain silent under such conditions, says Sister White. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Do you wonder that when I see the beginning of a work that would remove some of the pillars of our faith, I have something, something to say. I must obey the command. Meet it. Now, this series B, number two, page 58. Uh, this is in, in connection with uh, what John Harvey Kellogg was teaching. And, and I find this... Um, now, I don't know any, how many of you have read the book, The Living Temple. I've read it. I Actually, when I read it, it was a long time ago because I had to order it. It didn't have PDFs online. We didn't have computers at that time. Uh, so I ordered it from the library. And I got the, the copy I got came from the Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, so you could order a book from the library, and they'd find somewhere in the library system in, the, in North America. Uh, so it's kind of kind of interesting. But often we misunderstand what the, what, what the error was. Ellen White calls it the alpha of apostasy. And she says the omega is going to be, I can't remember the adjective she uses, but it's going to be worse, right? Now, what was the problem with pantheism? Because it wasn't full-blown pantheism. You know, he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, doing nature worship. He wasn't, uh, you know, bowing down to to trees and plants and stuff like that. What, what was the issue of pantheism with Wagner and uh, Kellogg? Because Wagner was involved with it as well. So what was the issue? Anybody know? I thought God was, God was the, his creation. God was his creation. Okay, yeah, well, pantheism is the idea that God is in nature, right? Yeah, now, yeah. Um, now, now, God created nature, that he's, he's not a part of nature. And, and Kellogg was teaching things like, uh, well, when you eat bread, you know, because God spoke it into existence, he's sort of in his creation. And so you're eating the, any bread you eat, is, is like recognizing the body of Christ. And and so it's really a kind of a, a fanciful, it opened the door to spiritualism. And I know Felix is reading a book called The, the Everlasting Covenant by Wagner. And you'll find these statements in there, Felix. Uh, so Wagner, subtle. Kind of subtle. Okay. Now, 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 it was a seed that was being planted. So it wasn't full-blown error. But Ellen White recognized that there was this, this error of pantheism. Now, Christian pantheism was really popular in uh, uh, the late uh, 1900s, or late 1800s, early 1900s, in England, where Wagner was. And, and it was something that was sort of a counterfeit. It sort of seemed to be spiritual on the surface, but it was planting a seed uh, that would then bear fruit later on. So if you believe that uh, atonement was completed at the cross, if you believe that 
that God is in every person, right? He's in everything. There would be no need for the sanctuary message. So these, these things are both tied together. Now, a lot of times you see people saying that, well, the problem with uh, what, why, what uh, Kellogg was teaching was, you know, the Holy Spirit and all that kind of stuff, the Trinity, right? That's People have tried to frame pantheism as having something to do with the Trinity, but it really doesn't. Okay, so um, let's go on and read here. And this is another statement from Spirit of Prophecy uh, from Series B as well. Again, uh, the enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. The fundamental truths that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Now, I'm of the view that this, what she was doing was prophesying what happened in 1919 Bible Conference, which Jeff mentioned, I think it was Jeff mentioned it. So has the Seventh-day Adventist began, begun writing books of a new order after the death of Ellen White? With, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have this system of intellectual philosophy. We know that the church sought to get accredited accreditation with so we wanted to get um, our ministers to have degrees in other universities um, some of the first people that did that were people like um, uh, Edwin Thiel right he went to the University of Chicago to the Syrian school there and wrote that book um, the mysterious numbers of the Hebrew Kings which uh, destroys biblical chronology um, but we also had, you know, the book that opened up what we would call the, the third generation of Adventism, that is the doctrine of Christ by W.W. W. Prescott. So the doctrine of Christ is the precursor to what Seventh-day Adventists answer questions on doctrine. And today, uh, one of those things is, what well, was, is the spiritual formation, the one project and requiring every minister to be trained in spiritual formation. Yeah. So, but, you, you know, we, we look at sort of the result now, right? But there's so much confusion in the church, and it's easy to, to see the problems that exist within the church. But we need to know the root of where those problems have arisen. Because often people will think, because they can recognize let's say spiritual formation and the church is off on this or off on that. They don't realize how integrated these errors have become within Adventism and how they're, they're sort of our spiritual inheritance, so to speak. Um, and now it's something I've been aware of when I first became an Adventist, just how Adventists don't like to be called a cult, Right. So, you know, that's, that's so they're going to try to do everything they can to be accepted, which is not a good thing. Right. I mean, if you're presenting the truth and, and you you decide that, well, I, I can't be accepted if I present the truth. So I'm going to water it down so that people will accept me. But you really haven't given the gospel. So we can see that reorganization has occurred that this false re reformation has occurred. And um, we now have a new organization, right? With the books of a new order and a system. And that's been that way long before I became an Adventist. But I also really, I shouldn't say I like this statement, but it's something that's, that's very, very powerful. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. And do we see that to be the case? That's for sure. 
Yeah. Because if you have the truth, do you need to use force? Do you need to use manipulation? Truth is its own force. Right. When the church loses the power of the gospel, it'll seek the power of the state. And that is true of Adventism today. And, and it will even grow to be more and more. So, so we can see the seriousness of this problem. But what we have to see is we have to see what, what is really behind it all. What are, what are, where, did, where did the church go off course? Why did these doctrines become accepted? And how are they affecting our, our understanding today? That is often we will accept uh, some of these statements because we've heard them so many times um, and we can't distinguish that they're not true. Okay. Another statement from Spirit of Prophecy, shall we keep silent for fear of hurting their feelings? Shall we keep silent for fear of injuring their influence while souls are being beguiled? My message is no longer consent to listen without protest to the perversion of truth. Now, that's sometimes really hard to do because we are, as some day Adventists, loving and caring people. And, and we can sometimes be caught up in the idea of not wanting to hurt people, not wanting to scare them off. But there is a way to present a truth and there is a way to protest that is loving. And you know, I've shared many of my experiences in Warburg Church. You know, people, uh, ministers, conference officials presenting from our pulpits things that are error and us standing up, literally, in church, opposing what's being said. And, and I told is them, what is this? What's that? So yeah. the truth is going to offend. Yeah. But, uh, but sometimes, sometimes sometimes it wins people. So one who was the ministerial director, you know, as I've told the story before, he gave a message that was very wrong, full of error. Um, and I was one of the ones that stood up. Like Kristen, I think, stood up as well um, and basically rebuked him while he was doing a sermon. And he was a little bit taken aback, of course. But uh, and then I wrote him a letter. And the next I time love Warburg. Here, I love Warburg Church. I love Warburg Church for that. They're gentle about it, but they're firm. Yeah, it, it was. It wasn't harsh, but it was. It was clear. We just said no. We don't want to hear this. You know, from our pulpit. Um, and then I wrote him a letter. And and um, the next time he came to our church, he he gave a testimony of how he was affected by by that that he had been a closet conservative, but he just had had buried it so long in the closet, he sort of forgot. And uh, now he ended who, up... Who was that, if you don't mind saying? Um, I can't think of his name offhand. I'm really bad with names. Um, okay. He was a black guy. He was a ministerial director back in the uh, Yeah. I, I know who you're talking about. I'll try to recall the name as yeah. well. And then I heard him at uh, Millwood's church. He gave the same testimony. And then uh, the conference ended up uh, firing him. He ended up dying of cancer, I think. He had some kind of illness. I just can't think of his name. I, I don't think I have the letter still on my computer that I wrote him. I could look it up. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, we know that we have to stand up. Um, and there, there's ways of doing it, and it can win people, right? But often we're scared to do that. <clears throat> so the May 1st meeting. So May 1st is when they had their first meeting in 1956. I doubt that the Adventist leaders were fully aware of the many references in Mrs. White's works to the atonement now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary since 1844. If they were, how would they have dared to take the position they did in regard to the sanctuary question? This idea finds support in the apparent surprise of the two men who visited the vault and stated that in their research, they had become acutely aware of the E.G. White statements, which indicate that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, that's from the minutes, May 1st, 1957, page 1483. 
Why did they become acutely aware? The discovery seemed to surprise them. In using the plural statements, they admit of more than one reference. I do not know how many they found. I have found 17, and there are doubtless others. And why did they use the word indicate? Sister White does more than indicate. She makes definite pronouncements. Here are some of them. At the termination of the 2300 days, in 1844, Christ entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. That's from Great Controversy, page 422. Christ had only completed one part of his work as our intercessor to enter upon another portion of the work, and he still pleaded his blood before the Father in behalf of sinners. That's page 429 from Great Controversy. At the opening of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844, as Christ entered there to perform the closing work of the atonement, they saw that he was now officiating before the ark of God, pleading his blood in behalf of sinners. That's page 433. Christ is represented as continually standing at the altar, momentarily offering up the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Um, a mediator is essential because of the continual commission of sin. Jesus presents the oblation offered for every offense and every shortcoming of the sinner. Manuscript 50, 1900. These statements are definite. It was at the end of the 2300 days in 1844 that Christ entered the most holy to perform the closing work of the atonement. He had only completed one part of his work as our intercessor. In the first apartment, now he enters upon another portion of the work. He pleads his blood before the Father. He is continually standing at the altar. This is necessary because of the continual commission of sin. Jesus presents the oblation for every offense and every shortcoming of the sinner. This argues a continuing present atonement. He offers up momentarily. Jesus presents the oblation offered for every offense. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, 7 verse 25. It is presumed that when the two men stated that they had become acutely aware of the E.G. White statements, which indicate that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary, they had read the quotations here given and perhaps others. In view of this knowledge, what did they suggest should be done? Would they change their former erroneous opinions and harmonize with the plain words of the spirit of prophecy? No. On the contrary, they suggested to the trustees that some footnotes or appendix notes might appear in certain of the E.G. White books, clarifying very largely in the words of Ellen G. White, our understanding of the various phases of the atoning work of Christ. So that's from minutes page 1483. Ponder this amazing statement. They admit that Sister White says that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. And then they propose that insertions be made in some of Sister White's books that will give our understanding of the atonement. They were, however, only acting in harmony with the official statement and questions on doctrine. That when one reads in the writings of Ellen G. White that Christ is making atonement now, it should be understood that we simply mean that Christ is now making application, etc. Page 354, 355. Now, you can see that this change of language, is it important to understand that Christ, to say that Christ is only making application of the atonement that was done at the cross, and that he's not making atonement? What, what is that saying if we were to change those words and say, well, Ella White should have said that Christ is just making application of the atonement. He's not actually making atonement. What, what is that saying if we're going to try to correct the spirit of prophecy there? Once, <clears throat> once done, always done. Well, well, I'm but just it's saying. It's not being I, ministered to people now. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. yeah it that's was not done then, so it's good that's... forever. What I'm saying is the question is, what is that saying about our understanding of spirit of prophecy? It dilutes it. it. Dilutes it. Well, yeah. Well, Iran says it says we are smarter than God. We're putting ourselves above the prophet. Right. 
we're, we're saying, well, Ellen White wasn't really saying what she was saying. She's saying what we're now saying. So we need to make footnotes so that we can change what she was saying to agree with what we are now saying. And, th and that would be dishonest. So he goes on, he addresses this point. If Sister White were now living and should read this, she would most certainly deal with presumptions, presumptions, I think presumptuous writers, and in words that could be understood. She would not concede the right of anyone, whoever he might be, to change what she has written or interpret it so as to vitiate its clear meaning. The claim which questions on doctrines makes that she means what she does not say effectively destroys the force of all she has ever written. If we have to consult an inspired interpreter from Washington before knowing what she means, we might better discard the testimonies altogether. May God save his people. Okay, I'm just going to see how much more this section here. Okay, I'm going to finish this page. Early in the century, when the fate of the denomination hung in the balance, Sister White wrote, Satan has laid his plans to undermine our faith in the history of the cause and work of God. I'm deeply in earnest as I write this. Satan is working with men in prominent positions to sweep away the foundations of our faith. Shall we allow this to be done, brethren? So we know Ellen White says Satan is working with men in prominent positions to sweep away the foundations of our faith. That's 1903. It was happening then. It has occurred. Answering her question, shall we allow this to be done? She says, my message is no longer consent without protest to the perversion of truth. I have been instructed to warn our people for many are in danger of receiving theories and sophistries that undermine the foundation pillars of the faith. Right. Letters to Physicians and Ministers, Series B, number two, page 15. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us. To be cloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. But the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved, as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. So where are the truths of Adventism to be preserved, according to Sister White here? Are they preserved by the church? Are they going to be preserved in the statement of beliefs in the Seventh-day Adventist church? So that's where they, is that where they're preserved? No. Uh-uh. They're going to be preserved in his word, right, through his word yeah. and the testimony of his spirit. So, yeah. so we have to look to God's word and to the Holy Spirit to understand these truths, these way marks. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. Now, is that unquestionable, unquestionable authority the church? No, it's God's word. Yeah, it's God's word that's the unquestionable authority. Yep. Do you wonder that when I see the beginning of a work that would re remove some of the pillars of our faith, I have something to say. I must obey the command and meet it. Of course, he's already quoted that one before. Okay, so that we're going to start here next week. So any, any thoughts about what we have read? I mean, is this shocking to to us to read of this history? Somewhat. Um, I've been kind of familiar with it through the years, but mm -hmm. see it see it right here is a little shocking. Yeah, and, and for, uh, for me, it, for me, for yeah. me, it's kind of like the frog frog in water being slowly warmed up and boiled because <clears throat> it's, this. This has been coming for a while. Those kind of things yeah. um, creep, creeping up. And so it's not so yeah. shocking, but almost yeah. expected. Yeah. So, so in, in my in my experience as a Seventh Day Adventist, you know, as I've seen this through the years, 
I've seen a lot of people being critical of the church, but I don't see a lot of people really understanding the truth, right? Because it's it's easy to to criticize the church. We know that there's problems, and people will often focus upon the results, of, you know, of how the church acts and operates and, and so forth. But we need to really understand what the way marks are, what the foundation is, what the pillars are. And that's what I believe this movement was raised up to do, because many people who recognize the problems in the church don't really understand where those problems come from. And they either have another variation of the problems, another branch that's grown from those seeds that were planted, or sometimes it's just a reaction to it, but still not based upon truth. So we'll see all kinds of errors that exist within Adventism are because of the errors that exist within the church, right? If the church had been teaching, teaching the truth, would we have all these winds of doctrine? You know, it's, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Now, why wouldn't we? If the church had been teaching the truth, why wouldn't we have all these winds of doctrine? Why because, do the winds of doctrine? because we would have we would have met it. Well, we we would have a solid foundation, right? Yeah. The reason why we get these winds of doctrine is that the foundation has been unsettled, right? Adventists know there's a problem, but they don't know what the solution is, and so they they grasp at different things. Anti-Trinitarianism, uh, character of God, feast keeping, right? All different kinds of errors um, because there is a problem. They know there's a problem, but they don't know what the problem really is. They just see the manifestation of the problem. And, and so I think it's really important that we understand these things. We understand what the basis of the sanctuary truth is, that it's rooted and grounded in the reform lines, in the Millerite movement, in the parable of the ten virgins. And, and if we want to teach righteousness by faith, as many people believe that we should, and we only understand the third angel's message and we don't understand the first and second, then we're not going to have a, a complete understanding of the third angel's message. And, and I have run into all these different variations of the third angel's message, supposedly, within Adventism, that aren't the third angel's message. What are a few of those variations? Well, we could look at the 1888 message study committee. And um, uh, the guy who wrote the book, um, uh, Beyond Belief. Yeah, he spoke at Alberta camp meeting once. Uh, I can't quite recall his name. I always have trouble remembering his name. I think his name is Jack Secure. Jack Secure. Jack Secure. Yeah. 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 And then we have different variations that are a type of legalism. So there is a type of perfectionism that exists. That is people who they get very particular about maybe how you eat or how you dress. Right. Um, but there's very little, you know, love and compassion and forgiveness and things like that in how they deal with that. Yeah. They're usually focused upon other people's sins more than their own. Very little love and compassion for themselves. Even. Yes. Well, that as well. Yeah. So that kind of harsh sort of Adventism that does exist. It's not it's not super common, but it is. It, it's, you know, I would be characterized in that class by many people, you know, because I believe in overcoming sin. I must be, well, you saw that there, Felix, at that last study where they, uh, at, um, at the church, right? Remember in Sabbath school? Yeah. Where the, the one, of, one of the guys get teaching the Sabbath school said something about, I can't remember if he called it perfectionism at Geelong, yeah. Um, I think he called it perfectionism. And then he talked about how his son had got caught up in perfectionism. So there's a lot of Adventists who are very leery about anybody talking about overcoming sin. 
because they'll see that as legalism or perfectionism. But, you know, if he knew me personally, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have that opinion about what I was saying. He wouldn't see that type of thing. I understand with God all things possible, you know. What's that? Yeah, with God all things possible. People under, yeah. really understand with God all things possible. Yeah. Like, I don't believe in, you know, like, you know, beating myself up and, 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 you know, I'm not in, I'm not a legalist. I believe in God's power to transform me. But I'm not focused upon my own righteousness. I'm focused upon Christ. Right. So, so we have yeah, these different we're... types of, uh, of of errors that exist. Different views on the nature of Christ. Different views we're... on the Holy Spirit. We're... Yeah. One of the thing. One of the things that people, I believe, I've, I've experienced it myself, is seeing it, our experience where we're falling short. So we come to believe that it's not possible be yeah get quite discouraged because we're trying in our own power rather than faith and trust in god that he's working in us that which we cannot do ourselves yeah yeah we we need to we need to realize that it's in christ that our righteousness lies not in ourselves so that would be legalism where we try to see ourselves as righteous right righteousness by sight instead of righteousness by faith. But just because it's by faith doesn't mean it's not real, that it's not going to actually happen in our lives. It's just we don't look for it there. When we look at our lives, we should see ourselves as sinners. Wasn't there a form of that infecting the movement, uh, say, I don't know, three, four years ago, where people thought they had to be perfect by a certain date? Yeah, by November 9th, 2019, people were thinking they had to be perfect. And that was so bizarre to me that they somehow thought if they get perfect before November 9th, then they could, then they would never sin again, right? Be one of the 144,000. This understanding of righteousness by faith. Well, like what Ellen White says, that uh, to not, basically paraphrasing, we're not to stress over it. We will know soon enough if we are one of the 144,000. Yeah. Yeah. We'll so, know somehow? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we'll know because Christ will come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we'll know. Right. Okay. Because we're not going to really know except by faith, just trusting in God. Right. We'll see ourselves as we will see ourselves. 144,000, yeah, see themselves as sinners. They don't see Deser themselves as righteous. Deserving of death. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back to this next week. Yeah, so if we follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes and keep focused on him and his word to guide us, God, by God's grace, he will lead us home. Yeah. Recently, the, that, uh, ver sorry. Recently, the verse uh, <clears throat> struck me in a different way. That's I, will never, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means... Uh, the idea well, of really Christ good. does God God doesn't look down on us. He sits down with us. He came down to be with us in our fight with sin, our struggle against sin. So He has identified with us and sat down with us, and He's never going to leave us just because we are struggling with sin. Yeah, I mean, He came to save sinners, right? He didn't come to save the righteous. Right? He came to call sinners to repentance. And, and and we need to recognize that we are sinners. We never think of ourselves as righteous. Because even if I didn't sin in the last five minutes, it doesn't make me righteous. Right? Amen. Yeah. You know, so that's why I just find that thinking so strange because we are sinners. Doesn't matter. You know, we can't say, well, if if I say I stopped sinning, you know, you know, a, a month ago, would that mean that I'm righteous? You know, all I can do is look at my whole life. My life is a life of sin. It's a sin to claim. So the only righteousness that we can trust in is Jesus Christ.
Right. Christ is the only place that we can get righteousness. Now, I believe that that righteousness will appear in the life. Mm -hmm. That it will be seen, but not by me. I'm not looking for it as the evidence that I have it. I just, I know that, that I can trust by faith that God is going to perfect and finish that work that he began in me. When it's that, seen, when it's seen by others, we don't see it ourselves. And when it is seen by others, yeah. that, that we are, have the light of the countenance of the light of heaven on our countenance and our faces shining, mm -hmm. that raises the wrath against us. Ellen White says, those that are seeking to perfect Christian character will never indulge in the thought that they are sinless. Their lives may be living representatives of the, of the truth that they profess, but the closer they come to Christ, the more sinful they appear in their own eyes, because the more clearly they Amen. can see their own defects. Right? So the people who are self-righteous, you know, who believe that they have arrived, and, and they're very particular about certain types of sins— like, you know, not eating between meals and things like that, things that they can easily control. Uh, but when it comes to love and mercy, um, they can't control that. They can't control their characters, that they're unchristlike in, in so many ways, and yet they think they're righteous, right? That does exist within Adventism. And that's why the people focus upon the things that they can control and think that that makes them righteous. But the things that they they can't control are the things they can't even see about themselves. So our responsibility is to see that we're sinners, right? To come to Christ every day and to see our need of him, to listen to his voice, to pray, to study, to struggle, to wrestle, wrestle with God. And and that that brings all kinds of suffering and all kinds of revelations. Um, about our characters and about God's character and his ability to save us. So, okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so thankful, Lord, for the Sabbath. And we are thankful for each person that joins in these studies and of those that um, have watched these studies on YouTube. We know, Lord, that we are faulty people. We look at ourselves and we see our weaknesses. We know, Lord, that uh, it is your truth and your power that is going to prevail. And so we trust, Lord, that you can do this work upon this earth, that you can use us in whatever way uh, that you see fit. Forgive us for our sins and help us to depend upon you and trust fully in you. I pray for each one of us, each of our families, and uh, you know the struggles that we face each day. We just pray that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing and that we can experience your presence, your joy, and your peace. And we pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.